Chapter One of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017. Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. Chapter One. Peril in Paradise In the tropical jungle-like garden behind the hotel, a man stood absolutely motionless. The broad trunk of the coconut palm tree behind which he lurked protected him from being seen by anyone on the hotel's wide, sweeping porch. The tent set of the man's features showed his growing impatience. The broad porch ran all around four sides of the white, sprawling Royal Poinciana Hotel on Waikiki Beach, in Honolulu, Hawaii. The porch was called The Deck, and it had been designed to resemble the promenade deck of an ocean liner. It was an open porch, or deck, with brightly coloured floral-patterned umbrellas spreading welcome shade. The deck was spotted with lounge and captain's chairs, and its teakwood floor was marked off at regular intervals with shuffleboard courts. The foredeck, that part of the porch running across the front of the hotel, overlooked the beautiful beach and its rolling, coiling breakers. Chairs and tables scattered on it were occupied by people waiting for the noon meal. On the rear deck, overlooking the carefully planned, luxuriant jungle garden, only one couple could be seen. Will they never leave, the man muttered to himself. He looked at his watch, then carefully peered around the tree, looking up at the deck jutting out from the hotel's second floor. Just as he did so, the couple got up from their chairs and walked leisurely away, heading for the other side. The man waited until they rounded a corner and were out of sight. Then he moved swiftly. His linen-clad figure was a white flash against broad green leaves as he dashed for the steps leading up to the now unoccupied porch. Once on the deck, he moved casually, as though he were just another tourist. He walked softly on crepe-soled shoes, making no sound. Nearing the centre of the porch, the man pressed his back against the white-painted wall, almost blending into it except for his dark, swarthy face. Now he moved sidewise, crab-like, until he reached a partly opened lattice door. He stopped, pressing his head against the slight crack where the door was hinged. Moments passed. Then he heard the sharp jangling sound of a telephone ringing from within the room beyond. Next, he heard the soft pad of feet on thick piled carpet as the room's occupant crossed the floor to take the call. Now the prowler abandoned his extreme caution. He looked through the partly open door. He saw the back of a man sitting at a telephone table. The prowler carefully pulled the door open and slipped into the room. Its occupant had the phone's receiver to his ear. On your call to Mr. Thomas Brewster in Indianapolis, Indiana, sir, the operator was saying, they are ringing that number now. The prowler crept closer until he was within an arm's length of the seated man. Yes, the man said into the telephone, I'll hold the line. With his free hand he pulled a well-used pipe from his jacket pocket and stuck it in his mouth. Then he patted the table for matches. He opened a drawer and felt in it. The prowler watched his prey anxiously. He was an old man with shaggy white hair hanging down almost to his collar. Unable to find a match, the old man had just started to turn when the operator spoke again. This is Honolulu, Hawaii, calling Mr. Thomas Brewster, she said. A few seconds passed. Here's your party, sir. The prowler stood there, arms raised, the fingers of his cut hands spread like talons just over the old man's shoulders. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter Two, A Disturbing Call I'll get it, I'll get it. It was the voice of eleven-year-old Monica Brewster. You always do, grumbled her twin brother Ted. I never do get to answer the telephone, not when you're in the house. Monica wasn't listening. She was flying into the kitchen to answer the steady ring before her mother could lift the phone from its cradle. Mr. Brewster's study was nearer, and there was a telephone in there, too. But Monica knew that her father was in the study, talking to her older brother Biff. She was sure the call was from her friend Betsy, because Betsy generally called her at about five o'clock in the afternoon. Monica didn't want her father interrupting her talk with Bets. Daddy didn't approve of long phone gabs. Moments later, Monica came bursting through the living room. Her excitement was at a pitch as high as her voice. Daddy, Daddy, the call's from Honolulu. Someone's calling you from Honolulu. Take it easy, sis, or you'll explode. Biff grinned as he saw the eagerness on his sister's flushed face. Thomas Brewster picked up the telephone. He listened briefly, then cupped his hand over the mouthpiece and spoke to his older son. Close the door, Biff, behind your sister. Biff got up from his chair and gently ushered Monica, protesting, out of the study. When he turned back, he was startled to see that an expression of worry clouded his father's face. Yes, Joanne, I agree. Mr. Brewster gave the name its Germanic pronunciation, Johann. Biff could only distinguish a mumble of words coming from nearly 4,000 miles away. Well, Johann, don't take any chances yourself, Mr. Brewster continued. Wait until I get there. Danger? There's always danger when the stakes are as high as those we're playing for. What? Thomas Brewster's frown deepened. Perez Soto? You say Perez Soto is there? I don't like that one little bit. The letter, though, you have it safely hidden. Again, the speaker at the other end took over the conversation. Biff could hear only a scramble of sounds coming from the telephone. He saw his father nod his head absently, his brows knitted into deeper thought. You think your room was searched, he exclaimed. Had you hidden the letter? Biff watched his father intently. Mr. Brewster listened attentively to a long reply. At last he said, that's bad, Johan, very bad. We have to make the best of it, though. All right, Johan. Yes, leaving here tomorrow, Northwest Airlines. Take off from Seattle early the next morning, Wednesday, at 5 a.m. Be in Hawaii about 8 o'clock, your time. You're stopping at the Royal Ponciana, aren't you? Hello? Hello? Johan? Thomas Brewster waited a few moments. Hello? Then he hung up and turned to Biff. That's funny, he didn't answer. Maybe we were cut off. Maybe the three minutes were up, Biff suggested with a smile. That's not as funny as you think, my boy, his father chuckled. Dr. Weber's a peculiar man about some things having to do with money. A call from Honolulu to Indianapolis means nothing to him, but if the operator told him his three minutes were up, he'd hang up quickly. He obeys what he thinks are the rules. Biff laughed. Isn't Dr. Weber the famous scientist? I'm sure I've heard you speak of him. That's right, Biff. He's a staff consultant for Ajax. I've worked with him before. Biff nodded his head. I thought so. Thomas Brewster was the chief field engineer for the Ajax Mining Company, headquarters Indianapolis, Indiana. His job took him all over the world to many of the strangest and least known spots on the globe. Whenever it was possible, he took 16-year-old Biff along. One of my reasons for going to Hawaii is to meet Dr. Weber, Biff's father continued now. You mean the engineers' conference isn't the main reason, Biff asked? Thomas Brewster shook his head. No. Oh, the meeting is important, all right. But I doubt if I would have gone out there for that alone. Dr. Weber wrote me over a month ago, said he wanted to meet me and Jim Huntington. He said it was very important, but he didn't go into details. I imagine he didn't want to put too much information on paper, afraid it might be seen by eyes other than my own. Biff was thinking. 
It seems to me, Dad, that I've heard you mention this Mr. Huntington before, too. Am I right? Probably. I hadn't heard from Huntington for a long, long time. But he did some work for me in the past. What's going on, Dad? And what was all that about a letter? Thomas Brewster sighed. Oh, the letter. Forget you ever heard about it. Dr. Weber told me Jim Huntington was lost at sea, sailing up to Hawaii from New Zealand, got caught in a terrific storm, and his sloop sank. He was able to send a radio signal of his position, but Weber said a sea and air search has failed, so far, to discover any trace of Huntington or his sloop. Gee, that's really too bad. Do you know why he wanted to see you and Dr. Weber? Biff asked. I have an idea, and if what I think is true, then Jim Huntington's loss is a very real one for the whole world. I heard you mention there might be danger, Biff stopped. A spark of excitement flashed across his face. His blue eyes lighted up. Danger, Biff? Well, we've been in tight spots before. You in China and with me in Brazil, Tom Brewster paused, then said slowly, there's always an element of danger in the work we do for Ajax. Biff, his face serious, nodded his head. He was thinking of Hawaii, our fiftieth state. What danger could there be there? The telephone operator at the Royal Pontiana Hotel on Waikiki Beach, Honolulu, looked up as her luncheon relief came into her small room. Hi. Am I ever glad to see you? I'm just about starved. I'm on a diet. Not for much longer, though. Hey, something funny's going on. That old gent in Suite 210 made a stateside call just now and didn't hang up when he finished. Imagine. He left the phone off the hook. I'll tell a bellboy to hop up there when I go out. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Worried Twins. Although he didn't want to show it, 11 year old Ted Brewster was just as excited as his sister over the call from Honolulu. He slipped quietly over to the door of the study. He wanted to know what the call was all about. He got there just in time to see Monica ushered firmly out as Biff closed the door behind her. Who was it, sis? Ted demanded. Don't know. Monica shook her head. It was just the operator saying she had a call from Honolulu for Mr. Thomas Brewster. You better go out and hang up the phone in the kitchen, Ted ordered. Monica left the room and returned almost immediately. You didn't listen in, Ted asked suspiciously. Course not. I have very excellent manners. No lady would listen in. Ha, ah, Ted sneered. You, a lady? A eleven-year-old lady? I'm older than you, Monica replied. Ten minutes older. Call that older. I don't. And don't tell me you never listen in. How's about yesterday? when I was talking to Pizzo. I suppose you didn't try to listen in then. That's different. You're only a kid. A kid? This was too much. And what about you? You think you're so grown up. The twins glared at one another. Then, without any reason, glares suddenly turned to smiles, followed by unexplained, uncontrolled laughter. Neither one of the twins could stay angry very long. When their giggles died away, they strained their ears towards the study door. Sure is a long call, Ted said. Hope nothing's gone wrong. Gone wrong? What could go wrong, Ted? Monica's voice showed her concern. I don't know. But I sure hope that call doesn't mean we're not going to Hawaii. Now Monica was really worried. Golly, I just couldn't bear it. Not to go? Me too. Biff gets to go everywhere. When do I get to go anywhere? Or me? The two sat in silence, thinking how cruel the world was to eleven-year-olds. 
The Brewster's summer cottage on Vineyard Lake, that was nothing. Their speedboat and water skis, they seemed like nothing too. And their Christmas trip to Florida, visiting their grandparents, what were all those things compared to going to Hawaii? They had been to many places in continental United States, but neither of the twins had ever been out of the country. Well, even if Hawaii was now part of the U.S., they preferred to think they were going to an exotic new land. That was why, when their father had told them just a week before he was going to take the whole family with him to Hawaii, the twins' joy knew no limits. They had known their father was going to Hawaii for a three-week stay. He was to attend an international conference of mining engineers. He was even going to deliver one of the most important speeches at the meeting. Biff Brewster was the oldest of the three Brewster children. He had gone with his father on several of his explorations. But Biff was sixteen, an age Ted could hardly wait to reach. Biff even had his driver's license. To Ted, this was the highest goal anybody could hope to reach. The Brewster family had been having a cookout in their backyard when Mr. Brewster made his wonderful announcement. One more week, and it's off to Hawaii, he said. Is Biff going? Ted asked. The children's father had smiled and turned to Mrs. Brewster. Let's pack the small fry and take them along, too. What? whooped Ted, his hot dog hitting the grass and his lemonade spilling all over his shorts as he leapt to his feet. And me? Me? I'm going, too? Monica hurled herself at her father, her arms encircling his neck. Easy there, princess. I'd rather have this food inside me, not on the outside. Thomas Brewster put his daughter down. He looked at her eager, upturned face. Her hazel eyes sparkled. She had never looked prettier to him, and Mr. Brewster had always thought her the fairest princess of them all. Copper-coloured hair framed her oval, pixie face. The summer sun had bronzed her clear skin. Keeping up with her brother, Ted, had given her a straight, sturdy figure. A nuisance at times, when her spirit shot higher than Pike's Peak, she was the darling of the family and had to be squelched only three or four times a week. "'What about it, Ted?' Mr. Brewster said teasingly. "'Think your sister ought to come along too?' "'Sure, Dad, sure,' was the quick reply. Monica flashed a loving look at her brother. "'All right, if you say so. Okay by you, Mother?' And you, Biff? You mean we're all going? A look of disbelief crossed Mrs. Brewster's face. That's right, time we all had a vacation together. I won't be too busy at this meeting, and I'm sure we'd all like to visit our fiftieth state. Biff followed his father's words without speaking. He surely felt good, though, about what his father was saying. Biff knew how envious his brother and sister were of the trips he had made. This time, they were going along, too the whole family. They'd have a swell time. Dad was really tops. A smile softened Biff's strong-featured face. His blue-gray eyes lighted up. He moved off the deck chair where he was sprawled and walked over to drape an arm over his mother's shoulders. He was taller than his mother, with broad, square shoulders. For a sixteen-year-old, Biff was big and husky. He had to be to have come out of his many adventures unharmed. "'Won't it be swell, Mom?' he said. "'Dad couldn't have done anything to make Ted and Monny happier.' Now, looking at his father's worried face, Biff wondered if the call from Dr. Weber might mean a change in plans. He hoped not. Not only for his own sake, but for his brothers and sisters. It would be a wonderful rest and vacation for Mother, too. Biff wished he knew more about his father's real reason for the trip. "'Dad!' Will that call make any difference about your taking us on the trip with you? I don't know, his father said slowly. Dr. Weber's call puts the whole trip in a new light. Gosh, Dad, Ted's and Monica's hearts would be broken. Tom Brewster stood up. He went to the door without replying. When he opened it, his two younger children swarmed all over him. That call from Honolulu? What was it about? Ted asked. "'Tell us, tell us,' chirped Monica. Mrs. Brewster entered the room. She looked at her husband questioningly. The twins looked at their father. He ruffled Ted's hair and patted Monica on the cheek. "'We're still going, aren't we?' Monica said in a small, hopeful voice. "'I guess.' 
Yes, we sure are. Squeals of delight filled the air. But Mrs. Brewster, reading the expression on her husband's face, knew that the trip was no longer just a pleasure jaunt for him. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017. Chapter Four Aloha. The blue waters of the Pacific Ocean, fourteen thousand feet below, sparkled under the slanting rays of the rising sun. Sleepy-eyed passengers aboard the Northwest Airliner yawned, stretched, and brought their reclining seats to an upright position. Two stewardesses hurried back and forth along the aisle of the plane, carrying breakfast trays of chilled pineapple juice, slices of golden yellow papaya, and steaming coffee. The younger members of the Brewster family, Biff and the two twins, had been awake from the time of takeoff although their mother had insisted they try to rest. Mr. and Mrs. Brewster still lay stretched out with their chairs in a reclining position, but now they showed signs of coming out of their fitful sleep. How much longer, Biff? How long till we get there? You've been to Honolulu before, Monica said. Only for a short stopover on my way to Burma, Biff replied. He looked at his watch. I'd say we ought to be there in an hour, maybe a little longer. The Brewster family had boarded the plane at six o'clock that morning, their flight having been delayed on takeoff for an hour by a low-hanging bank of fog. The big plane's four jet engines and a favourable tailwind had pushed it through the sky at a speed of over 600 miles per hour. Thomas Brewster leaned over the seat in front of him, where Ted and Monica were fussing in low tones over whose turn it was to sit next to the window. Morning, children. Morning, Dad. My, you're surely wide awake for such an early hour, he said. Early? Gee, Dad, it's after ten o'clock, Ted replied, looking at his wristwatch. Mr. Brewster laughed. Guess Ted doesn't know about setting his watch back. You set yours right, Biff? Biff nodded his head. What do you mean, set my watch back, Ted demanded. Difference in time, Ted. With daylight saving time further complicating matters, it's three hours earlier in Hawaii than it is in Seattle. So if your watch says ten, then it's only seven o'clock in Honolulu. People are just getting up there. Ted, although still puzzled, turned his watch back three hours. Biff came to the seat where Ted and Monica both had their noses pressed to the plane's window. Scrunch over, small fry. We'll be raising diamond heads soon. Your big brother will point it out to you. The plane zoomed through the air, racing the sun to Aloha land. The fastened seatbelt sign flashed on. Won't be long now, Biff said. Ought to see diamond head any minute. Look, just over the right wing. See that sort of dark blur? That's Ohu, the island Honolulu is on. Minutes later, Diamond Head rose majestically into view. The plane sped over the yawning crater of the extinct volcano, then bore to the left out over Honolulu Harbour. It turned back north, coming in low, and then settled gently down on Honolulu's international airport. The plane rolled to a stop, Doors opened and landing ramps were wheeled into place. The twins, hardly able to contain their excitement, were first at the exit. Biff, his mother and his father were right behind them. Outside, a band played the familiar welcoming song, Aloha. Native girls in hula skirts, with fragrant flowers in their hair and brightly coloured necklaces of more flowers around their necks, swayed to the rhythm of the music. Monica danced down the landing ramp. At its foot, a hula dancer stepped forward and placed a lee, a beautiful necklace woven of flowers, around the excited girl's neck. Ted got the same treatment. 
more lees for Biff and Mr. and Mrs. Brewster, until the whole family wore fragrant chains of flowers up to their chins. "'Oh, mother!' exclaimed Monica. "'It's everything I ever dreamed of, just like I've read about and seen in pictures.' It was a gay, exciting sight. The warm air, the gentle breeze, the music, a real aloha, a real welcome. The spirit of Hawaii took over at once. Everywhere happy people became happier. Gaiety filled the air. A soft scent of flowers cloaked the new arrivals. The crowd milled about the gate leading to the terminal. It seemed there were hundreds of people all trying to pass through at once, the Brewster family clung together, Monica clutching her mother's hand. Thomas Brewster looked carefully over the crowd. I don't see Dr. Weber, he said to Biff. I thought surely he'd meet us. Maybe he's just late, Dan. Ted came up and touched Biff's sleeve. Look, Biff, see that man over there, he pointed. Biff looked in the direction Ted indicated. See, Biff, he's taking pictures. He took several of you and Dad. I was watching him. Biff's eyes met those of the man with the camera. He was a swarthy man, short, wearing a rumpled white suit. Gee, I guess Dad must be some sort of a celebrity, taking his picture and all, Ted said excitedly. Biff didn't think that was the reason. The man didn't look like a newspaper photographer on an assignment. His eyes shifted as Biff stared at him. The man made no attempt to get just one more shot, as official cameramen are apt to do. Biff started towards him, determined to find out why the man seemed to be so interested in photographing Mr. Brewster. Seeing Biff approach, the man drew back, fading into the crowd. By the time Biff had forced his way to where the man had been standing, the picture-taker had disappeared. Biff frowned. He hadn't liked the man's appearance, and his slinking away made Biff even more suspicious. Why had he taken the pictures? How had he known which of the arriving visitors was Mr. Brewster? Biff shook his head. The answer to that question might have some connection with the call his father had received from Dr. Weber. He had better tell his father about the incident, Biff decided. He rejoined the family and was about to speak when Mr. Brewster raised his voice. Over here, over here, Mr. May and Ali. He waved to an approaching man, who in turn waved back, calling, Aloha, my friend, aloha. It was Hanali Mehanili, a native Hawaiian with whom the Brewster family was to stay during their visit to the islands. Mr. Mehanili was the Hawaiian representative of the Ajax Mining Company. Introductions were made, and with the smiling Hawaiian leading the way, the party entered the airport terminal. Passing a newsstand, Mr. Brewster halted quickly. He strode to the newsstand and snatched up a copy of the Honolulu Star Bulletin. Biff stepped to his father's side and read the eight-column headline over his shoulder. Dr. Weber, famous scientist, missing. End of chapter four. Chapter 5 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017. Chapter 5 Detective Biff. Thomas Brewster read the startling story hurriedly. Biff read along with him. The story was sketchy. There were few details. Dr. Weber had been scheduled to open the first session of the Mining Engineers' Conference the previous afternoon. The meeting had started, but Dr. Weber failed to appear. When the meeting ended and Dr. Weber was still missing, the police were notified. Do you know anything about this, Hank? Mr. Brewster asked. Hanali Menenili? Hanali was the highwayan form of the proper name, Henry. Among his business associates, Mr. Mahanili liked to be called Hank. His Hawaiian friends called him Hanale. Yes, my friend, I do, Mr. Mahanili replied. It is most sad, most frightening. In fact, 
I was the one who discovered his disappearance. When and how? Mr. Bruce's voice showed his concern. Yesterday afternoon at the opening of the conference, Tom Brewster turned to his wife, Martha, why don't you take Ted and Monica over to that bench and sit down? We'll only be a minute. Biff, you stay with me. I want you to know what's going on. Sorry, Hank, but I didn't want my wife alarmed. Please continue. Biff felt highly pleased that his father wanted him in on whatever was happening. Well, Tom, when Johann failed to appear at his place at the speaker's table, I thought at first he might have been detained, perhaps held up by traffic, or that he might have been napping after lunch and had overslept. He's an old man, you know, and not too strong. Yes, I know, we've all been worried about him. He still tries to do too much for a man his age. I waited about fifteen minutes, Hanale Mahanili continued. Then I left the head table to go to his hotel. He's staying at the Royal Pontiana. On my way there, my fears that he had become ill increased. Mr. Mahanili paused, as if ordering his thoughts. Yes, yes, go on. At the hotel I rang his room. There was no answer. I went to the desk, and they told me they believed the doctor was still in his room. He hadn't left his key at the desk which was his habit every time he left the room. I bet you were really worried then, Biff said. I certainly was, young man. I called the manager and we went up to Johann's room. The manager had a pass key, and after knocking we entered his suite. And no Johann Weber, Mr. Brewster said. That's right, Tom. He has a two-room suite. He wasn't in either room. Was there any evidence that the room had been searched? Mr. Mahanili shook his head. It was hard to tell. Papers on his desk were in a disordered mess. Two drawers in his bureau were pulled out, with clothing messed up, and a few things strewn on the floor. But you know how careless Johann was. He was never one for neatness and order. But it could have been someone else who had searched the desk and pulled out the drawers, Mr. Brewster said. Yes, it could. There is no way of telling, definitely. Sir, said Biff, were you able to get any idea of when... He had last been in his room. No, Biff, we weren't. I was coming to that. We questioned the elevator operators and the desk clerks, both night and day clerks. None of them could remember when they had last seen the doctor. Biff's brows were knitted in questioning thought. Sir, I'd like to make a suggestion, or rather ask you this. Do you know if Dr. Weber usually had his breakfast in his room? Why, the idea never occurred to us. Good thinking, son, Mr. Brewster said. And were the maids asked if his bed had been slept in the night before? Henry Mahanili gave a shrug of helplessness. I'm afraid, young man, that you're a far better detective than I am. No, the maids weren't questioned. Well then, Dad, Thomas Brewster interrupted his son. I'm right with you, Biff. Our first stop in Honolulu had better be the Royal Pontiana Hotel. My car's right outside. Your luggage should be off the plane by now, Mr. Mayanilli said. The hotel's on the beach, Waikiki Beach. I'm sure your family would enjoy seeing the most famous beach in the United States. Gee, that's great, Biff said. Ted and Monica will flip, and so will I. After all, we're tourists. All right, let's go. Luggage and family were assembled and placed in Mr. Mayanilli's open convertible. The Brewsters were in for a thrilling ride. Leaving the airport, Mr. Mahanili turned into a dual thoroughfare called Ala Moana. They crossed the Ala Way Canal, nearing the famous Waikiki Beach section. On the right, Mr. Mahanili pointed out, is the Kapiyama Basin. Yachts of every colour and description lay at anchor in the beautiful harbour. Some were moving out into the main harbour of Honolulu. Everywhere the Brewster family looked, they saw flowers. One street would be lined with trees bearing white flowers. The next street would be one of red flowering trees, or yellow, or deep blue. The car turned off Ala Moana onto Kalia Road. They saw the gleaming dome of the Hawaiian village. To their right now, they could see the beautiful hotel standing like sentinels guarding the beach. Then Mr. Mahanelli turned the car into the spacious Garden of Eden-like grounds of the Royal Pontiana Hotel. Mrs. Brewster and the twins walked down to the beach. Biff, his father, and the Hawaiian friends went into the hotel. 
The manager of the Royal Pontiana received the two men and Biff in his office. Biff looked at his father. Go ahead, Biff. This was your idea. Sir, Biff said, addressing the manager, I wonder if you could find out if Dr. Weber usually had his breakfast in his room since he's been here. Easily, young man. Won't take a minute. The manager picked up the telephone on his desk. And would you ask if he had breakfast there yesterday morning? The manager nodded his head and spoke into the phone. He asked both questions Biff had suggested, nodded his head and replaced the phone on its cradle. No real help there. Sometimes he called for breakfast service, sometimes not. Yesterday morning, room service reports, there was no call from suite 21011. That's where Dr. Weber was staying. Well, one more thing, Biff continued his role of detective. Would the same maids who were on duty yesterday be on duty this morning? I'll check that with the floor supervisor. I think I know what your question will be. Had Dr. Weber's bed been slept in? Biff smiled. That's right, sir. Again, the manager placed his call and asked his questions. The floor supervisor will call back as soon as she's checked. Only take a minute or two. While we wait, let me extend my welcome to Hawaii to you. I regret that this most unfortunate situation has come about. But I'm sure Dr. Weber will be found. Thank you, Thomas Brewster said. I hope you are right. The telephone rang. Yes, yes, I see. Thank you. The manager replaced the phone. The supervisor says the maid who takes care of that suite said Dr. Weber's bed had not been slept in Monday night. Biff looked away from his father to Mr. Mayanelli. Nothing was said for a moment. Then Mr. Brewster spoke. Any more questions, Biff? No, sir. I can't think of anything else, Dad. Not now. Well, we have established the fact that Dr. Weber must have disappeared sometime on Monday, Mr. Brewster said. That was the day he telephoned you, wasn't it, Dad? Biff asked. Yes, I talked to him late in the afternoon. Here, that would have been around noon, Hawaii time. I know he was calling from this hotel, so we can pinpoint his disappearance from somewhere between noon Monday to early Monday night. The doctor always retired early. Thank you very much for your cooperation, Mr. Pearson, Mr. Mahanelli said. With Biff and his father, he arose and left the manager's office. They walked out into the bright sunlight and across a broad patio, hedged in by flame-coloured flowers. The beach of Waikiki was right in front of them. As they walked toward it to find Mrs. Brewster and the twins, the swarthy man with the camera who had been at the airport earlier, stepped from behind a palm tree and watched them go. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017 Chapter 6. The Letter Hanale Mahenelli had driven only a short distance from the Royal Ponciana when Monica, in the rear seat of the convertible, let out a howl. Monica, whatever in the world, her mother said. My Lee, my Lee, I left it on the beach, Monica wailed. Knew you would, her brother Ted said, in his I told you so voice. Mr. Mahenelli turned to Tom Brewster and smiled. That's easily taken care of. We can get them anywhere along here. They pulled the car over to the curb in front of a charming hotel constructed of red and white coral. Just to the left of the entrance to the hotel's palm-studded grounds sat an old woman surrounded by flowers of every colour and species. The woman was seated in a high-backed chair made of coconut fronds, with her feet in a tub filled with pink, red and yellow buds. A flame-red hibiscus was stabbed in her topknot. She was a plump Hawaiian woman, dressed in a flowered muumu, the island representation of the Mother Hubbard dress introduced many years ago by New England missionaries. The old woman's brown, deeply lined face cracked into a smile as the Brewsters got out of the car. Mr. Mayanelli spoke to her in the musical words of the native Hawaiian. The old woman's deft hands grasped a long, slender lee needle 
and her hand seemed to fly as she swiftly threaded at least a hundred flowers onto a beautiful garland. This lee, Mr. Mahanelli explained, is being made of the plumeria. You see, he picked up one of the flowers. It has five petals. Smell it. Mrs. Brewster took the flower. My, that's lovely. It seems to me I've been smelling this lovely scent ever since we've been here. You have. This blossom is highly perfumed. It makes our island the sweetest smelling place in the world. The old woman had finished. She arose and draped the newly made lee around Monica's neck. For the nanny kiaikai, she said. That means for the beautiful child. Monica blushed, but her smile showed her pleasure. Thank you, she said, dipping her head. Mr. Mahanelli handed the woman some money. Mahalo, mahalo, she said. And now she's saying thank you to us, Hank Mahanelli explained. Half an hour later, following a thrilling ride up the twisting road running over the Pali, the cliffs, of the Kulau mountain range, they dropped swiftly down to sea level again on the north side of the island. A short run along broad curving beaches and they arrived at the Mayanilis beach front home on Waymanalo Bay. The warmth and gracious hospitality of the Mayanali family made the Brewsters feel at home immediately. The Mayanali's son, Likake, 15, and Biff were old friends within an hour of their meeting. Little Wicolia, Mayanelli was just Monica and Ted's age, but quite a bit smaller. She considered the twins her personal property and showed them around with great pride. There was only one cloud to mar the Brewster's sky-high happiness. Dr. Johann Weber was still missing. Late in the second afternoon of the Brewster's stay in Honolulu, Biff and Likake were swimming when Biff saw his father come down to the beach and hail him. Let's go, Lee, Biff called, and the boys rode a breaker back to the shore. Hi, Dad, you want me? Water dripped off Biff's tanned body. Likake, his round brown face, with its usual eager expression, stood beside him. I want you to get dressed now, son. I'd like you to come to the dinner and evening session of our meeting, Mr. Brewster said. You bet, Dad. Wouldn't miss it for anything. This is the night you speak, isn't it? Yes, Tom Brewster smiled. But that isn't the main reason for my wanting you there. I'll tell you about it later. OK, Dad, may Likake come along? Surely. Mr. and Mrs. Mahanili are coming. The little ones will stay at home. Likake had gone on ahead. What's it all about, Dad? Something to do with Dr. Weber? Biff asked. Not exactly, Biff, but I think there's going to be a man at the dinner tonight I want you to get a look at. There could be a connection between him and Dr. Weber's disappearance. Is that man, Perez something or other, the one you mentioned when you got that phone call at home? He's the man, Biff. Biff's brows were knitted in thought. Dad, there's something I've been wanting to do, Biff interrupted. Is it all right if I do a little snooping after you speak? You'll be at the reception and dance. I got an idea, and Likake said he'd help me. Snooping, son, when trained detectives are on the job. This is a vacation, and I want you to enjoy it. But there's no reason why you and Likake can't nose about a bit. Don't do anything foolish, though. The dinner was over. Biff had tried not to stare too hard, nor too long at the husky, shifty-eyed man at the next table. Perez Soto. Biff sensed the sheer physical power of the man, and he shuddered involuntarily. This was no opponent to treat lightly. He couldn't help thinking, Biff Brewster, take a warning. The chairman rapped for order. Guests at the head table were introduced, and then the chairman turned to Thomas Brewster. We are very happy tonight, the chairman said, to have so distinguished a speaker with us. You all know him. You all know of the many contributions he has made in our field. I refer, of course, to the chief field engineer of the Ajax Mining Company, Mr. Thomas Brewster. Mrs. Brewster smiled proudly at her husband. Tom Brewster arose. His talk was short, direct, and crisply delivered. He received an ovation when he concluded. Biff looked at Likake and winked. The two boys slipped away from the table unnoticed. Outside the hotel, Biff asked, Which way? The Ponciana's just a short walk from here. We'll go in the back way, through the garden. You're sure it's all right? This bellboy is a good friend of yours? Biff inquired. Sure, I know Halle really well. His brother, Keone, and I go to Kamehameha School. 
That's a school only for boys and girls of Hawaiian ancestry. We're almost like blood brothers. The night was moonlit. Palm leaves rustled under a gentle breeze. The steady murmur of the surf was clear in the night air. Biff and Likake reached the garden of the Royal Pontiana. Halle told me that he would fix it so the deck door of Dr. Weber's room would be open. Come on, Lee said. The boys walked boldly through the hotel's garden. Biff knew better than to try to hide their presence. To do so would attract attention, that was just what he didn't want to do. They mounted the stairs to the hotel's second floor and walked along the deck until they reached Dr. Weber's room. Halle had done his job. The door was open. Biff entered the room. Likake, his heart pounding, was right on his heels. The room was faintly lighted by the moonlight from outside. Biff paused in the middle of the room to allow his eyes to become accustomed to the dim light. Then he started his search. Ever since the call to Indianapolis, Biff had wondered about the letter mentioned during the conversation. His father had said, forget it, but Biff hadn't been able to. The letter had to mean something. Where would a man like Dr. Weber hide a letter? Biff asked himself. He felt certain that Dr. Weber had been kidnapped, but he didn't think the abductors had the letter. If they did, then why were they holding the doctor? Of course, I could be all wrong, Biff told himself, but he didn't think he was. Likake, Lee, come here, Biff whispered and was startled to hear Lee's voice right back of him. I am here, right with you, Lee sounded scared, Biff thought. Okay, you take the bathroom. It's a letter we're looking for. I'll take the bedroom. Then we'll both search this room. The boys made a swift but thorough search. Nothing in the bathroom, nothing in the bedroom. Now where do we look? Lee asked. You take that side of the room. I'll start by the hall door. Biff's search started at the telephone table. Nothing in the drawers. But there wouldn't be, Biff told himself. Too obvious a place. He started to leave the table and, glancing down, saw that the table must have been left in the same condition it had been in on the day of the call. Crumbs of tobacco were scattered on the tabletop. Several burned matches were in an ashtray. The doctor's tobacco pouch lay at the base of the lamp. Biff picked it up idly, looking about the room for the next spot to search. Standing there, swinging the pouch by its drawstring, he thought he heard paper crackle. He stood motionless, halting the swing of the pouch. He strained his ears. Nothing. He tossed the pouch back on the table. Again he heard the slight sound of paper crinkling. Biff snatched the pouch up again. He opened the pouch. His hand darted in it and dug deeply in the tobacco. Paper. His fingers weren't wrong. He withdrew the paper and held it close to his eyes. It was a letter, all right. Biff, Biff, look out, Lee shouted. Biff turned just in time to see a figure leap at him. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017. Chapter Seven: An Important Find. Biff sidestepped quickly. His attacker's charge struck him a glancing blow, spinning him around. He stumbled backward, almost losing his footing. In the dim light, Biff saw the man turn and crouch, ready to charge again. This time, Biff met charge with charge. The man came at him low. Biff hurtled his body at the attacker even lower. He threw a bone-crushing football block at the man's knees. The attacker was upended, his head striking the floor, his legs flying upward as if he were diving. Biff leapt to his feet. Come on, Biff, Lee called from the open doorway. Biff sprang to the door, hurtling over his attacker lying on the floor. He felt sure he had cleared him when a hand snaked up and grabbed Biff by one ankle. Biff crashed to the floor, stretched out, his head pointing towards Lee, who was standing in the doorway in dismay. Rising on one knee, Biff turned to jerk his ankle free. The man held on with a vice-like grip. Biff thought fast. Here, Lee, catch, he tossed Dr. Weber's tobacco pouch to his friend. It fell at Lee's feet. Grab it, Lee. Grab it and scram. I'll be all right. Lee bent over and snatched up the tobacco pouch. He stood in the doorway, hesitating. Don't wait, Biff called fiercely. Get out of here fast. Lee, shocked by the sudden violence, was confused. He felt he should stay and help his friend, but Biff had ordered him out. Apparently the important thing was to escape with the tobacco pouch. 
He turned, shot through the door, and ran swiftly, silently along the porch. Biff now turned his full attention to freeing himself. He knew he would have to make his getaway fast. Someone in the hotel was certain to have heard the sounds of violence coming from the room. There was no time for an investigation. Biff knew that he was as much of a prowler as his attacker. The attacker changed his tactics. Now he wanted to get free of Biff. Oh, no, you don't, Biff muttered and threw his arm around the man's legs. He knew that Lee was now the attacker's prey, Lee and the tobacco pouch. Biff held on. The man, struggling to remain upright, struck him savagely at the base of Biff's skull. Biff rolled, avoiding the paralyzing blow. The attacker, freed of Biff's grasp, leapt for the door. Biff was on his feet right behind him. Reaching the door, Biff saw the man dash for the steps. Instead of following immediately, Biff decided to wait a moment. Surely Lee had gotten clear. Lee knew the grounds of the hotel well. He'd be able to avoid capture and make a clean getaway with the pouch and its valuable letter. When the attacker was out of sight, down the stairs, Biff stepped out onto the porch. He straightened his jacket. He wanted to look like a guest of the hotel if anyone stopped him. From behind, he heard the sounds of someone banging on the corridor door. The time has come, he said to himself, for me to make my departure from this charming hostelry. He walked unhurriedly towards the stairs. Once there, though, he dashed down them, taking three steps at a time. In moments, he was concealed behind a spreading poinciana shrub. Biff stood silently. He strained his ears for any sound, the sound of either Lee or his attacker. Only the soft rustling of palm fronds came to his ears. He decided to move out taking great care to remain in the cover of trees and shrubs. The moonlight was too brilliant. Biff moved cautiously through the garden. He decided against returning the same way he and Lee had come. He felt sure that his attacker had followed them from the hotel where his father had spoken. The man might figure the boys would return to the hotel. He'd be waiting for them there, Biff reasoned. Sure hope Lee figures it the way I have, Biff told himself. Biff walked in the opposite direction. He came to the edge of the garden. The street was only a few feet away, a few feet, but those few feet were open space, no cover, unprotected from the view of others. I just have to chance it, Biff said softly. He planned to dash across the opening, run down the street and hope to find a cruising taxi cab. Biff tensed. He thought he heard a noise behind him. It sounded like a small twig snapping. He turned his head slowly. He didn't want a second attack from behind that night. Now he felt positive that someone was moving in the shrubbery nearby. Then he heard it softly, barely audible above the noise of the rustling leaves and nearby surf. Biff! Biff let out his held breath in a deep sigh of relief. Right here, Lee, he called. His Hawaiian friend emerged from behind a tree and joined him. You all right, Biff? You hurt? Lee asked anxiously. Me? No, not even shaken up. But how about you? And the tobacco pouch? You've still got it. Lee nodded his head, extending a hand with the pouch in it. Swell, Lee. Great. How did you get away? Did that guy try to follow you? He tried to follow all right, but I fooled him. I kept just far enough ahead of him so that he could hear me. I made little noises. Biff could see Lee's grin in the moonlight. So I could lead him away. I wanted to be sure you got away okay. Pretty smart, Lee, but how did you finally shake him off? I led him way to the rear of the garden. Then I quit making any noise. I moved like a cat, circled around and headed for here. I sort of figured you wouldn't try to get back to the other hotel. Good figuring. You and I are going to make a great team. But I think we'd better get out of here fast before Nosy figures the same way we did. Where would be the best place to get a cab? Just follow me. Lee turned, and instead of heading for the street, he plunged back into the garden. He led Biff along the edge of the garden till they came to a low hedge fence, the rear boundary of the Pontiana's grounds. Lee leapt over it, Biff following. Then the Hawaiian boy cut to his right, and in a few moments they had jumped another hedge into another formal garden. Where are we now? Biff asked in a whisper. This is the garden of Aloha Ailey. That means Aloha House. It's a small hotel. We can find a taxi right out in front. Come on. They moved noiselessly through the garden and emerged on the lighted street just to the left of the hotel's entrance. They were lucky. A taxi cab was waiting at its stand. The boys quickly hopped in. Biff sat back. Relief came to him, and he suddenly realized how much his recent exertions had taken out of him. Wowie! Am I ever glad to get out of that? Me too, Biff. Where do we go? 
Back to the hotel or home? To your house. I told Dad we'd take a cab back. Lee gave the driver instructions. Biff looked at the luminous dial of his watch. Jeepers, do you know it's been two hours since we left the hotel? Seems like only minutes. Tom Brewster and Hank Mahanelli were still up when the boys reached home. Well, we were beginning to wonder what has happened to you two, Tom Brewster said. Plenty, Dad, Biff said, smiling. It looks like it. His father was looking at Biff's rumpled white jacket. One shoulder of it bore a smudge where he had landed on the green carpet of Dr. Weber's room. We had a little adventure, Biff said, more than we expected. You all right, Lee? Hank Mahanelli asked, a worried look on his face. Sure, Dad, it was Biff who had the fight. Fight? Tom Brewster stood up. Just what happened, son? Biff gave his father and Hank Mahanelli a fast fill-in on the night's adventure. But we got what we were looking for, he concluded. Biff reached in his jacket pocket and pulled out Dr. Weber's tobacco pouch. He took out the crumpled letter. This has a New Zealand postmark on it. I think it's the letter you talked to Dr. Weber about when he called you back in Indianapolis. I haven't read it, though. Thought you might not want me to know what's in it. Thomas Brewster took the letter. He read it rapidly, then re-read it. His frown showed how deep his concentration was. Without a word, he handed the letter to Mahanelli. The Hawaiian read it. The two boys watched their parents. Finally, Biff spoke. Is it important, Dad? I thought it might be. Very important, Biff. Wouldn't you say so, Hank? Unbelievably so. Biff looked questioningly at his father. This is the letter Dr. Weber mentioned, the letter he received from Jim Huntington. It tells of a fine Jim made in New Zealand, a fabulous mining discovery. And that's why he was coming here to meet you and Dr. Weber, Biff asked. That's right, son. Then whoever it was attacked me tonight or kidnapped Dr. Weber would know where the find was, too. Not exactly, Biff. They'd know of it, but not where it was. Huntington was bringing samples of the ore and details of its location with him. That information, then, must still be in his sunken sloop, Biff said. Tom Brewster nodded his head. We'll have to find it, won't we, Dad? the boy asked eagerly. We're surely going to try. There was silence for several minutes. Everyone's mind was filled with thoughts. Dad, it was Biff who broke the silence. Don't you think we can read good news in my finding this letter? How do you mean, Biff? Well, wouldn't you think from this that Dr. Weber must still be alive? Why do you say that, Biff? Hank Mahinelli asked. Well, sir, whoever grabbed him, since they didn't find the letter, must figure Dr. Weber knows what Mr. Huntington discovered, and they're holding him until he tells them about it, or tells them where the letter is. They couldn't know that the location isn't described in the letter. But how would they know anything about it if they hadn't seen the letter? Lee piped up. They have their ways, Tom Brewster replied. The doctor probably told someone else about Huntington's coming here. Not that he would have said why, but Huntington's explorations are well known. Whoever kidnapped Dr. Weber would know that a meeting between Dr. Weber, Huntington and me could lead to something of tremendous value. And what is that, Dad? Can you tell me? I could, Biff, but I don't think I will, not yet. The fewer people who know what Huntington discovered, the better. And it would be safer for you, too, not to know. You mean, Dad? Biff paused. Yes, Biff. You're in this now right up to your young neck. It could easily be figured that you now know as much as Dr. Weber, since you found the letter. That makes you a target, too. Biff found it difficult to swallow the lump which had suddenly come into his throat. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017. Chapter 8 The Police Call Did you get a good look at your attacker, Biff? Tom Brewster asked his son. Gee, Dad, he came at me too fast, and it was fairly dark in the room. I was wondering, Perez Soto, you know, the man I pointed out to you at the dinner, well, he wasn't at the reception afterward. I thought he might have followed you boys. I don't think so, 
Dad. Perez Soto is a good-sized man. Husky. This fellow I had the hassle with was smaller, I think. And that Mr. Perez Soto, Lee added, he was wearing a white dinner jacket. This man wasn't. He could have changed some, Hank Mianelli pointed out. Lee's right, though, Biss said. I think we both will agree that it wasn't Perez Soto. All right, boys, better get to bed. It's late and tomorrow's going to be a big day. It was a big day and it ended with a bang. The engineering conference had wound up the night before with the dinner at which Biss father spoke. This day, the day following, Hanali Mayanelli had invited a selected group from among those who had attended the conference to a, a luar at his house. The prospects of going to the luar, the traditional Hawaiian feast, especially one cooked by a native of the island, was exciting. Hank Mahanelli had been up early to get things underway. He was going to supervise the cooking of the luar personally. It took all day to prepare a luau properly, and when Hank Mahanelli did something, he did it right. Biff and Lee helped with the early preparations. They dug a deep pit in which a pig would be roasted. Anything else we can do, sir, Biff asked. Not now, Biff, his Hawaiian friend replied. Then how about a swim, Lee, Biff inquired. Want to try real surfing this morning, Lee asked. Do I? Let's go. Since Biff had arrived, the boys had swum before breakfast, after breakfast, and practically all their free time. Lee was an expert swimmer, especially underwater. At first, Biff became worried when his new friend died and seemed to remain underwater long past the safety point. But always, Lee's laughing face would break the water just when Biff was about to dive for him. Biff and Lee hit the water and swam out into the ocean with powerful strokes. Biff was just a bit faster than Lee. They took the plunge first to loosen up their muscles and become accustomed to the water. Next, they tackled the surfboards. Lee swam most of the way back underwater. You still worry me, Lee. I don't know how you can hold your breath for that long, Biff remarked as the boys walked up the beach. Just practice, Biff. I've been doing it since I could walk, I guess. Dad tells me I could swim before I could walk. The boys paused to watch an outrigger come plunging towards the shore atop a long, rolling wave. The outrigger was being paddled furiously by two Hawaiian boys. On one side of the canoe, its outrigging extended out in two arching arms, connected by a buoyant float of willy-willy wood to give the slender canoe more stability. The canoe ground ashore and its laughing passengers scrambled out. All set, Biff, ready to make a real try at it today? By me, that's fine. I think I almost got the knack of it yesterday. When it comes to you, it comes all of a sudden. You just sort of feel it. I hope I feel it today, Biff said, laughing. The first day the boys had swum out to where the long rollers formed and had ridden them in, their bodies held stiff. Lee wanted Biff to become accustomed to the waves, then they had started with the surfboards. The two boys walked across the beach to two long, brightly painted surfboards made of willy-willy wood. They carried the boards out into the ocean until they were waist-deep. Then, sprawling on the boards, they paddled offshore several hundred yards. OK, we'll try it here. Head your board towards the shore, Lee called. Biff slowly turned his board until its pointed bow was aimed at the beach. OK, I'm ready. Let the first few waves pass until you get the feel and lift. Then when one comes that feels good, that's the only way I can explain it. Start paddling like crazy. Biff followed instructions. He felt himself being lifted by the first wave, then a second. Now came a huge roller, raising both boys high above the trough left by the preceding roller. Biff started paddling furiously, still lying face down on the board. He felt the wave grab it. The board picked up speed, riding right at the crest of the roller. He had made it. Lee was alongside. The boys were speeding shoreward at nearly 30 miles per hour. When the roller broke on the shallow shore, Biff was tossed off in the foaming breaker. He grabbed his board and held on until the wave smoothed out. Gee, that was the most thrilling ride I've ever had, he exclaimed. You did great, Biff, Lee said. But just wait, if you think that was a charge, wait till you ride the board standing up. How about it? Let's go, Biff agreed promptly. Out they went again. Again they waited for the right feel of the roller. Biff felt one take his board. He was speeding shoreward. He looked over the water at his friend. 
He saw Lee rise to a knee crouch, then slowly straighten up until he was standing straight, head held high. Biff tried it. He got to his knees. Carefully feeling for his balance, he started straightening up. I've done it, he said triumphantly to himself. He looked shoreward just in time to catch a blinding splash of salt spray. He blinked his eyes, and the next thing he knew, he was floundering in the water. Lee, seeing what had happened, leapt off his board, turned it, and came paddling back to Biff. I meant to tell you, when you get up, hold your head high and back. Then the salt spray doesn't hit you in the eyes. Now you tell me, Biff said laughing. I'm going to make it this time. They started out even. Lee got up first. Biff took seconds longer. He was more careful this time. The tough part was straightening up from a crouching position to an erect one, then placing one foot ahead of the other and getting a good balance. Biff rose slowly, slowly but surely. He made it. The two boys rode standing up, only a few feet separating their two boards. Lee turned to Biff and grinned. Then he clasped his hands over his head, making a handshake of congratulation. He was so thrilled at seeing Biff make it that he forgot about himself. This time it was the expert who spilled himself into the water. Biff rode triumphantly into the shore alone. The luau was ready. The guests had arrived. Lee burst into Biff's room. Wiki, wiki, Biff. Hurry, everything's ready. I'm wiki, wiki, just as fast as I can. Here he put on his aloha shirt. All the canes wear them. The wahinis, the women, wear holukus or mu-mus. You call them Mother Hubbards, only ours are brightly coloured with big flowers printed on them. What do the kids, what do you call them? Cakeys, what do they wear? Lee laughed at Biff's pronunciation. How many times have I had to tell you that every letter in a Hawaiian word is pronounced? Here's how you say children in Hawaiian. K-E-Keys, with the accent on the first syllable. Okay, Lee K K. Gee, that's the first time you've said my name right. You stick around enough and you'll be a real Hawaiian. What's your name in English, Lee? Biff asked. Richard. Okay, Dick, let's go. The luau was being held in the garden in the rear of the Mahanelli's home. Under gaily striped awnings, long tables had been set up. They were decorated with fragrant-smelling ferns, flowers, pineapples, and bananas. At each place setting, there had been placed a knee, a coconut with its top slashed off, still containing the wai nui, or coconut water, which would be sipped with the meal. Hank Mayanelli stood over the lua, the hole Biff and Lee had dug earlier in the day, making sure that the pua was done to a turn. A lua isn't the real thing without a roast pig. Already everyone, Hank called out and started cutting pieces off the pig. The meat was so tender it fell apart. Hank placed the meal on tea leaves, and servants carried it to the tables. What a meal, Biff said, finding his place beside Lee. Never saw so much food. In addition to the pua, there was a yuneke, a small bowl of poi, taro root pounded to a paste. There was a dish called pa, or lua liomi, salmon, which didn't look a bit like salmon, since it had been shredded and kneaded into a salad. There was also a dish of moa, chicken cooked in coconut juice, and another pa of opi, a small, delicately flavoured shellfish. This wasn't all. There were piles of ear fish and sweet potatoes called uala kalua. If I eat all this, I'll explode, Biff said. Here, have some of this, Lee said. What is it? There was a suspicious look on Biff's face. It's a leisure called limu. Biff took a small bite. His face lit up. It's good, but what is it? Seaweed, Lee said and burst into laughter. Honestly, this is seaweed. That's right. Not the kind you know, though. This is an edible seaweed. I'll say it's edible. Give me more. Everywhere one looked, Mayonelli's guests were devouring the food. Strange though some of it looked, no one could deny the food's succulents. People were falling too, as if they hadn't eaten for days. Biff took one final bite and sat back. Couldn't eat another thing if I had to. Don't think I'll ever want to eat again. He looked at his friend and smiled. Mihalo Akane. Thanks, friend. Biff's attention was attracted by a Hawaiian, not in luau dress, but in business clothes, coming across the garden. He saw the man approach Mr. Mayanelli. Who's that? Biff asked, nudging Lee. Lee looked, and his face became serious. 
golly, that's Mr. Capacta. I wonder what he's doing here. And just who, Akani, is Mr. Capacta? Biff asked. He's the chief of the Honolulu police. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. Chapter Nine Mysterious Message. I am sorry to interrupt your festivities, Chief of Police Kepatka said to Mr. Maninheli. That's all right, Keone, Lee's father replied courteously. We're at the end of our luar, and I know you've got your job to do. Just what is it? You have word of the missing Dr. Weber? Well, the answer to that has been both yes and no. Actually, I'm here to see one of your guests. You have a Mr. Thomas Brewster staying with you, do you not? Why, yes, we do. And his son? Yes. Mr. Brewster and his family are staying with me, on their visit to the islands. I'd like to speak to them, the chief requested. Hank Mahanelli excused himself and crossed the garden to where Mr. and Mrs. Brewster stood chatting with other guests. Biff and Lee had watched the police chief talking to Lee's father. Now they saw Mr. Mahanelli and Mr. Brewster coming toward them. Come along, Biff, his father said. Police want to talk to us. Lee tagged along the deep brown eyes in his bronze face wide with curiosity. I'm Thomas Brewster, Chief, and this is my son, Biff. Has Dr. Weber been found? No, Mr. Brewster, unfortunately not. But it is Dr. Weber you want to see us about. In a way, yes. Let me explain. An hour ago we had a call from Wailuku. That's the capital of the island of Maui. An emergency case had been brought to the hospital there, a man suffering from a deep stab wound. The man was identified as a certain Yuan Tokato. He had a police record, a minor criminal, in and out of several scrapes, but a bad character, a man for hire. Yes, but what has that to do with me or my son? Mr. Brewster asked. I'm coming to that, sir. Tokato was found unconscious. At the time the police called from Weiluku, he was still unconscious, so they hadn't been able to question him. They did find in his wallet, though, a picture, a small photograph, two photographs, in fact. They identified the man in one of the photos from a picture that appeared on the front page of our Honolulu paper yesterday. Chief Keone Kapartaka paused. He apparently enjoyed building up suspense. The photograph in our paper was one of you, Mr. Brewster. It appeared the day you spoke at the mining engineers' meeting. I know, but I don't see. The small photo found in Tawakto's pocket was also of you, Mr. Brewster. Of you and a lad whom I presume to be your son, this boy here. He looked at Biff. Remember, Dad, I told you about the man at the airport snapping pictures of you, of you and me. Ted spotted him first, Biff reminded his father. Thomas Brewster nodded his head. Well, Chief Kapadaka, I can't imagine why any criminal would be carrying a picture of me and my son. But remember, Mr. Brewster, I said the man was carrying two pictures. Yes. The other picture was that of the missing Dr. Weber. The police chief's last statement struck the group like a bombshell. For moments, nothing was said. The chief broke the silence. I'm sure that now you will see the connection, he said. Yes, Thomas Brewster replied. There must be one. But just what? Have you any ideas? Only this, Mr. Brewster. The man Taquato must have been hired to keep a close check on you and your son's movements. I suspect he was in Honolulu yesterday. He must have learned something, something of value to someone. Say, Dad, I wonder if that man could have been the one who... who... Biff paused. He didn't want to reveal to the police chief that he had gone into Dr. Weber's rooms at the Royal Pontiana without authority. You know, Dad, the man I had that little scrape with. Could have been, son. 
The police chief looked at Biff with renewed interest. However, he didn't press Biff for a fuller explanation. It is my belief, Mr. Brewster, Chief Kapratka continued, that when Tokato went back to Mayu, he thought his information was worth more than he was being paid. His attempts at getting more money were rewarded by a stab in the abdomen. Some reward, Biff interjected. But why the island of May? his father asked. The police chief shrugged his shoulders. Biff touched his father's arms. I have an idea on that, Dad, he said. Let's hear it, son. Wouldn't you think that perhaps Dr. Weber might be on the island, or on a nearby one, and that whoever kidnapped him must have his headquarters there? The three men considered Biff's idea. You could be right, Biff. Do you agree, Chief? Chief Kapataka nodded his head in agreement. The police on Maui have asked you to come to Wailuku. They want you there when Tawaka has recovered sufficiently for questioning, the chief said. If he recovers, he added. We'll go right away. Can you come along, Hank? Certainly. Let me explain to my guests. Biff felt a tug on his sleeve. It was Lee. How about asking if I can go too, Biff? Sure, you can help us, Biff turned to his father. Dad, Lee ought to go along too. He speaks Hawaiian, and he and I might pick up some valuable information. Would you ask Mr. Mayanelli? Thomas Brewster nodded his head. You better go and pack a small bag. We may be there for a day or two. Hop to it. We want to get over there quickly. Biff and Lee went into the house. We'll get there soon, Biff. We'll take the inter-island streetcar system. Streetcar? What are you talking about? Streetcars running across the ocean? Lee chuckled. That's what we call the Hawaiian Airlines. They make so many flights each day, it's just like standing on a corner waiting for the next streetcar. And it was. When the boys and their fathers reached the airport, they learned there was a plane taking off within 15 minutes. The flight to Kahului the principal airport at Maui took only 30 minutes. They arrived just as dusk was spreading over the valley island, as Maui is called. The drive from the airport to the capital of Maui, Weiuku, was a short one. The police were expecting them. We've just been talking to the police at Hana, the Weiuku police chief said. Takato is still on the danger list. They haven't been able to get anything out of him. Then this Takawato isn't here, Tom Brewster asked. No, he's in Hannah, a coastal town about 60 miles from here. Shouldn't we start right down there? You can, of course, Mr. Brewster. However, Takawato's been placed under heavy sedation. There's little chance you'll do any talking tonight. I'd suggest you spend the night here and then drive down early tomorrow morning. Oh, yes, Tom, Hank Minnelli said. You don't want to miss the drive to Hannah. It's a truly beautiful and thrilling experience. The sixty-mile drive was one of continuous curves. The road snaked around cliffs, dived down to sea level, then climbed back up another cliff. The party checked into the Han Mwaya Hotel, then left for the police station. Takawato had come out of his sedation, but was still in such serious condition that his words seemed a meaningless jumble during his conscious spells. I don't know if he's going to make it or not, Mr. Brewster said in a low voice. Biff stepped to the wounded man's bedside for a closer look. That is the man who was snapping pictures of us at the airport, Dad, he declared. Do you also think he is the one you had your tussle with? He could be, Biff said slowly. I'd say he's about the right size. I didn't get a close look at his face, though. Taquato moaned. He opened his eyes. He looked at Biff, and a frown of recognition crossed his face. He stretched out one hand and spoke. Ka lei, he said, and repeated the two Hawaiian words. Ka lie. What does that mean, Hank? Mr. Brewster asked. Ka lei is the name of the southern tip of the big island, Hawaii. I think he was trying to tell me that, Biff said. I'm sure he recognized me, and is trying to tell us that we ought to go to Ka lei. Biff's father nodded his head. I think you're right, Biff. Those words have a meaning for me too. 
I'll tell you about it later, back at the hotel. They walked the short distance back to their quarters. Hank, do you think we could charter a boat here for a couple of days? I'm sure we can. You're going to Hawaii? Yes, to Kele. But I want it thought that we're just off on a fishing cruise. No need for anyone but us to know our real reason for going. Do you think Dr. Weber might be being held on the big island, Biff asked. I think it quite likely, Biff, but there's still another reason for us to take a good look around Kay Lay. That I'll tell you about when we're on our boat at sea. Would you mind hopping up to my room and getting my sunglasses, Biff? Then we'll go and see about a boat. Biff took the stairs to the second floor, three at a stride. Lee was right behind him. Biff scrambled through his father's bag, looking for the glasses. Hey, Biff, look at this. Biff, glasses in hand, turned to see Lee pointing to the mirror of the room's dresser. He walked over for a closer look. On the mirror, written in soap, was a message. J.W. for C.S. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 10 Starting a Search. Biff wasted no time in getting back down to the lobby of the hotel. He told his father about the message written in soap. Just the letters you say. J.W. for C.S., Mr. Brewster exclaimed. Let's go back to my room. I want to see them for myself. The Brewsters and the Mayonellis went up the stairs. As they neared Mr. Brewster's room, they noticed its door was open. Now what can that mean? More trouble? That door was closed. The question flashed through Biff's mind, but he did not speak. The door, it developed, had been left ajar by the maid, but it was what she was doing that upset Thomas Brewster. They entered the room just in time to see the maid wiping the soap message off the mirror. Thomas Brewster started to speak, but he realised that she was only doing her job. When the maid left the room, Mr Brewster questioned his son closely. Now this is important, Biff, he said. Can you remember exactly how those letters were written? I mean, were they all capitals, or was one or more of them in lower case? Lower case? Lee looked puzzled. He means small letters, Lee. Now, let's see, Dad. I'm almost positive that the J and the W were capitals. How about you, Lee? Is that how you remember it? The Hawaiian lad nodded his head. And I think I'm sure about the C. It was a capital letter, too. Right, Lee? Gee, I think so, Biff. But what about the S, Biff? This is important, his father said. Biff frowned. He closed his eyes trying to recreate a mental picture of the soap scrawl. Dad, I can't be absolutely sure, but I think the S was a small letter. Biff looked at Lee. Lee could only shrug his shoulders. I think your memory is probably right, Biff. You have a pretty good one, and besides, it fits, Mr Brewster declared. I'm completely mystified, Hank Mahanelli put in. All this talk about letters, capitals and small letters. What do they mean, Tom? Well, first, I think, I hope, they mean that Dr. Weber is definitely alive. That's good news. They must also mean that he's being held prisoner. Not so good. The doctor is old, you know, and just how much he can stand at his age is doubtful. If he's alive, we'll find him, Biff cut in. But the letters, what do they mean? Hank repeated his question. The J and the W, I'm sure, stand for Johann Weber. The C, capital C, and the small s, is the chemical symbol for cesium. Cesium! Understanding came to Hank Mahanelli. Any informed engineer knew the importance of this element. Just what is cesium, Dad, and what is it used for? Technically, son, it's atomic number 55, and its atomic weight is 132.91. Its use? Mr. Brewster smiled. I'll tell you this. 
We'll never get to the moon without it. You mean it's used in rocket propulsion, Biff asked. That's right, Biff. It's a high-thrust, long-life rocket propulsion fuel. Most costly. More than gold? Lee asked eagerly. Much more, Lee. If you and Biff had about ten pounds of it between you, you could have your education paid at any college you wanted to go to. MIT, Caltech, any of them. Wow! Must be worth more than a thousand dollars a pound, then, Biff said, his voice filled with amazement. It is, Biff. The refining process is what makes it so expensive. Scientists and explorers, like Jim Huntington, have carried on extensive searches to locate a field where the purity of the ore is high, higher than in those fields we now know about. And Mr. Huntington, he thought he had made such a strike? Biff asked. Before answering, Tom Brewster went to the door. He opened it cautiously and looked up and down the hall. I don't want any eavesdroppers or spies lurking around. He had lowered his voice until it was little more than a whisper. Now I'll fill you in so you will know what we're up against. Hank, Mahanelli, Lee and Biff crowded close to Mr. Brewster. They didn't want to miss a word. That letter you found the other night, boys, is important. Not as important as Dr. Weber's abductors think it is, but it does tell us of a cesium find Huntington made in New Zealand. He felt it to be a sensational discovery. High-grade ore? Biff asked. Yes, in his letter to Dr. Weber, Huntington told of the find, of his belief in its high degree of purity. He was bringing a sample and a map of the location to Honolulu. Dr. Weber was to assay it. Then, if it proved out as expected, Ajax Mining was to move in on the deal and exploit the field. And Mr. Huntington never got here, Biff said. That's right. That call I received from Dr. Weber, you remember, Biff. The doctor had just arrived in Honolulu when the word of Huntington's loss at sea became known. There was an extensive sea and air search, but nothing was found, no sign of the sloop's wreckage, and even more unfortunately, no slightest sign of Huntington. How could that be, Mr. Brewster? Lee wanted to know. It is thought that Jim Huntington's sloop must have split its seams open in a heavy squall, Lee. Huntington apparently stuck by his boat and went down with it. Isn't it supposed to have gone down somewhere off K. Lee, Dad? That's right. But there's a lot of ocean off the southern tip of the island of Hawaii. Biff was frowning with concentration. K. Lai, he said. Those are the two words Tokawato mumbled to us this morning. And that's where we are going, his father said. You think Dr. Faber is being held somewhere near, though, while somebody tries to locate the sunken sloop? I'm sure of it now, Biff. Who do you think his abductors might be, Dad? Thomas Brewster looked at Hank Mahanelli. Any doubt in your mind, Hank? Not one bit, the Hawaiian answered, shaking his head. Perez Soto. He'll make contact with us again, Biff's father said. He doesn't know exactly what is in this letter Biff found. His message, the one written on that mirror, is telling me that if we want to see Dr. Weber alive again, then I'll have to tell him where the cesium strike is located. And that information is at the bottom of the sea, Biff said soberly. Yes, Mr. Brewster said. We've got to do everything we can to try and spot that sunken sloop. Dr. Weber's life depends on it. End of chapter 10「Eleven of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Eleven Wharf Rats. Biff's father had concluded his conversation. Now you all know as much as I do. Now we move into action. Biff, you and Lee will be our ground forces. Lee's father and I will take over the naval side. You mean we're not going to the big island with you? Biff was dismayed. No, Biff, I want you and Lee to roam about Hannah. 
You both had a good look at Perez Soto. I'm sure you could describe him. Make a few inquiries. See if any one of his description has been in Hannah recently. Hannah is a very big place. I'm sure he was here yesterday, probably met with Tequato, to Tequato's misfortune. We'll check on him too. We'll stop by the police station, Biff replied. Hank, Mr. Brewster went on, our job is to rent a boat, a yawl about thirty feet. Biff and I can sail, and I'm sure you and Lee have handled boats all your lives. I don't want a captain or a crew, just a boat. Think we can rent one here? I'm positive we can, Tom. All right, then. Boys, you start your investigation. You're pretty good at it, but be careful. Meet us back here in time for lunch. I hope we can sail tonight. Biff and Lee went to their room and changed into shorts. Then they went out to explore Hannah. The mid-morning sun was bright. The sky was clear. It was a beautiful day on the island of Mai. The boys covered the small business section, stopping in a few stores, and asking if anyone had seen a man answering to the description of Perez Soto. They were becoming discouraged as noon approached. Let's go to the police station, Lee. See how Tokuato's condition is, Biff suggested. They learned that the wounded man was still much the same. It would be a close thing if he lived. Leaving the police station, Biff had an idea. Look, Lee, he said, frowning, we're going about this thing all wrong. If Perret Soto kidnapped Dr. Weber and took him to Hawaii, he'd have to have a boat, wouldn't he? Sure, Biff, sure. Then let's head for the docks and find out if anyone looking like Perez Soto has rented a boat in the last week or so. Good idea, Biff. They headed for the waterfront. Suddenly Biff turned to his friend. Don't look back, Lee, he muttered, but I think we're being followed. Just walk along as we're doing now. When we get to the middle of the next block, you leave me. We'll shake hands, then you cross the street. Go into one of the stores. Find a place where you can see out but can't be seen from the street. Keep a sharp lookout. Lee's face showed his excitement. I get you, Biff. You want me to go to see if someone keeps on following you. That's right. I'm going to continue on down the street another few blocks. Then I'll cut back and meet you in front of one of those stores. Look sharp now. The boy solemnly shook hands. Biff clapped Lee on the shoulder. Be seeing you, he called loudly when Lee had reached the middle of the street. Then Biff continued his sightseeing walk along Hannah's main street. He desperately wanted to look behind him, but he knew that to do so would spoil his plan. He walked three blocks, stopping every so often to stare into a window. If he was being followed, he wanted to give Lee plenty of time to spot his pursuer. Toward the end of the street where the business section left off and the residential section began, Biff cut across the street, then started slowly back to his rendezvous with Lee on the opposite side. He saw Lee in front of a small store, standing under a brightly coloured awning. Well, did you see anything? Biff asked. I think so, Biff, but I don't know for sure. There was a man maybe one hundred feet behind you. Every time you stopped, he'd stop too, and sort of step into a doorway in case you looked back, I guess. Then I was being followed. Gee, Biff, I thought so at first, but then this man turned into a side street before you reached the end of your walk. How could you tell that from inside that store? Oh, well, I stepped out into the sidewalk so I could see better. Once you got down to the next block, I couldn't see you through the window any more. Biff smiled. I was being followed all right, Lee. But how can you be sure this man didn't keep on following you? You know why, Lee? Because when you stepped out onto the sidewalk, the man spotted you. He had seen you with me, and knew you had planted yourself in the store just to check and see if he was following me. Lee's face fell. Gee, I'm some detective. Charlie Chan would box my ears, as he was always doing with number one, son. I'm sorry, Biff. Don't let it get you down. Let's go find out about boats. If Lee had flunked his first detective test, he more than redeemed himself on his second. At the waterfront, the boys spotted several signs announcing boats for hire. Let me see if I can find a Kamaina, Lee suggested. I could talk to him. He might even know my family. Then I could find out a lot. 
Go ahead, Lee, good idea. I'll take a walk out on that dock and wait for you. Biff stood on the end of the pier, scaling small seashells into the water. He could see Lee going from place to place. At a nearby dock, Lee took much longer than at other places where he had inquired. Biff could see him talking to an old Hawaiian, bent of body, wearing a floppy sun hat. He saw Lee look in his direction and signal for him to come over. Proud excitement shone from Lee's face as Biff came up. "'I've got big news, Biff,' Lee exclaimed. "'This Kamaina has told me just what we wanted to know. "'He's an old man, speaks no English, "'but he says he knew my father's family many years ago.' "'Yes, but what about Perez Soto? "'I'm coming to that. "'The old timer says he didn't rent any boat last week, "'but at that dock up there,' "'Lee pointed to a dock about 100 feet down the shore, "'a Malinini, that means a newcomer, rented a big power boat about five days ago he can't remember the exact day he's old i guess and kind of forgetful but he thinks it was on a monday that would be last monday that was the day dr weber had disappeared good going lee biff exclaimed and you described perez soto i sure did and the kamania says he thinks it was the same man the man came to him first but he didn't have any boat big enough to suit this man well, Lee, I think we're getting somewhere. I want to try one more thing before we go back. I want to make sure I was being followed. I think it's important to know if any of Perez Soto's men are still in Hana. Why would they be, Lee demanded, if Perez Soto and the doctor are on the big island? Don't forget about Tokoato. I'm sure Perez Soto would want to know if Tokorana recovers enough to talk. What are you going to do? I've got a trick up my sleeve. If someone is following me, it might be because he thinks I might still have that letter. Biff took out his address book and tore paper from the back of it. You know, he might be just stupid enough to think I was still carrying the letter with me. Guess he'd have to be plenty Lolo for that, Biff. Plenty Lolo? What does that mean? It means dumb or stupid, Lee replied. Biff grinned. He took a pencil and scribbled a word on the paper. Then he stuck the paper in his hip pocket on top of his handkerchief. We'll walk over to that boathouse, Biff said. Halfway there, he stopped, pulled out his handkerchief and wiped his forehead. As he did so, the paper fell to the ground. Come on, he muttered. The boys entered the boathouse. They pretended to examine the boats, allowing themselves several minutes. Guess we've given our pursuer long enough, if we are being followed, Biff decided. They came back out of the boathouse and retraced their steps. At the spot where Biff had pulled out his handkerchief, he stopped again and looked carefully about him. We've been followed all right. The paper is gone, Biff said to Lee. What did you write on that paper, Biff? Lolo, Biff said, and the boys burst out laughing. Time had slipped by much faster than Biff and Lee realised. It was mid-afternoon when they got back to the hotel. Guess I've been so excited I forgot about eating, Lee said. But am I ever hungry now? I could eat my way through another liar, Lee, Biff agreed. At the front desk of the hotel they found a message from their fathers. We're checking out the boat. Biff's father had written. And getting supplies. Wait for us. Biff and Lee had a late lunch, took a small siesta, then had a refreshing swim in the hotel's pool. It was growing dark when Mr. Brewster and Hank Mahanelli came back. We've got the boat, Biff, and it's a real honey, as trim a craft as you ever want to see. Where is it, Dad? Biff wanted to see the boat. Tied up at the municipal wharf. Know where that is? Sure we do. We were down there this afternoon. I wonder how we missed you. Biff then told his father and Mr. Mahanelli what he and Lee had learned. I felt sure it would be Perez Soto. And he rented a powerful cabin cruiser? Mr. Brewster asked. That's right, Dad. Lee's Hamania friend thinks it was the Monday Dr. Weber disappeared. It all adds up. We can't get to Hawaii fast enough now. Are we leaving tonight? Biff asked. About ten o'clock. Have to wait until then for supplies to be delivered. Gee, 
Is it all right if Lee and I dash down to the dock and look at the boat? Sure. You'll have time, but don't stay too long. We'll be having dinner in an hour. Biff and Lee started for the door. Hey, Mr. Brewster called. Don't you think you ought to know the boat's name? It's the Easy Action. It was growing dark when Biff and Lee reached the dock. There was the trim craft, painted a bright white, with a golden arrow trimming its sides. Its two masts swayed gently from side to side in the gently rolling water. She's a beauty, all right, Biff said to Lee as they approached the boat. Come on, let's go aboard. Biff felt Lee's hand on his arm, restraining him. Hold it, Biff, Lee said in a whisper. I think I saw someone on the boat. Let's duck behind these pineapple crates. The boys secreted themselves. They peered intently at the yawl's portholes. There was barely enough light to see. There, did you see that? Biff nodded his head. They had seen a white-clad figure flash by one of the portholes. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Hawaiian Sea Hunt Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Twelve Bomb Away. For several moments, Biff and Lee remained absolutely quiet and motionless. They knew someone was on the boat, but what was he doing? Could he be one of the men bringing supplies to the boat? Lee whispered at last. Biff shook his head. No, I don't think so. You'd see activity on the deck too, and a truck somewhere nearby. No, we've got to investigate what that character is doing. I've got an idea, Biff. Let's have it, Lee. Well, look, you know how well I can swim under water. Suppose I slip into the water on this side of the wharf, then I'll swim under it, and I can come up right beside the boat. I'll move along from porthole to porthole and see if I can find out what's going on in the boat. Sounds okay to me. Good thing we changed into shorts. Be careful not to make any noise. Me? Biff? I'll be as quiet as a fish. He was too. There wasn't even the faintest kaplop as Lee lowered himself over the edge of the dock and sank into the water. Biff waited tensely. From behind his stack of pineapple crates, he could get a good view of the starboard side of the yawl. He could see right to the water line and the four portholes just above it. Moments became minutes, and it seemed to Biff that the minutes were stretching out much too long. Had Lee met some obstruction beneath the dock? Biff's worry was increasing. Finally, he noticed a circle of lightly rippling water near the bow of the boat. In the centre of the circle, he could just spot Lee's head. He watched as his friend slowly raised himself by the boat's starboard gunwale until his head was even with the porthole. Noiselessly, Lee dropped back into the water and took two strokes towards the stern. Now he peered into the second porthole. He repeated the process at the third porthole and moved on to the fourth. The fourth must be the one, Biff figured. That was the small compartment where the yawl's auxiliary engine was located. Lee took a longer time at this porthole. Biff watched him intently through the growing darkness. A slight movement on the boat caused him to raise his eyes. He gasped. Directly over Lee stood a man with a small nail keg raised over his head. He was ready to smash it down on Lee's head. Lee, look out, duck! The Hawaiian boy submerged just as the keg struck the water at the exact spot where his head had been. Jeepers, Biff thought. I hope Lee got far enough under. The keg hurler was running along the deck towards the boat's bow. Here he could leap on the dock and make his getaway. Biff went into action. He jumped from behind the crates, reached the boat in six fast strides, and leapt aboard just as the prowler reached the bow. Biff grabbed at the man. His arms encircled him, and Biff in turn felt the man's arm squeeze him in a bear-like hug. Biff exerted every ounce of his strength, trying to force the man over backward, trying to free himself of the man's crushing grip. He heard a faint noise directly behind the man. Looking over his shoulder, Biff saw the dripping figure of Lee scramble aboard. 
Lee didn't hesitate. He threw himself at the man, striking him just at the knees from the rear. Clipping flashed through Biff's mind. Unfair in football, but in a fight like this, there'd be no 15-yard penalty. The impact of Lee's body forced the man to release his grip. As he did, Biff stepped backwards. His feet became entangled in a coil of rope. He lost his balance, toppling backward. His feet hit the raised gunwale, and the next moment he was flying through the air. He felt himself falling, a sickening feeling, as if he were falling from a great height. He wasn't, though. He was falling from the bow, six feet to the water. But he was falling backward and had no time sense of the distance. He hit the water with a splash. His broad back smacked the water with the noise of a loud hand clap. Biff could feel his back sting from the impact. He turned over and looked up. There was the bow of the boat directly overhead. There was Lee looking down at him. You all right, Biff? There was a strange sound in Lee's voice. For a moment, Biff was angered. The strange sound was Lee trying to hold back his laughter. Biff's sense of humour came to his rescue. He must have been a funny sight, thrashing around in the water on his back like a beach porpoise. Yep, I'm all right, he called. I'll swim to midships. You can give me a hand up. Once back aboard, Biff's first concern was about the prowler. Oh, him, Lee said. When you made your backward belly whopper, that guy took off. He raced down the dock. He's long gone by now. Biff rubbed the small of his back with his left hand. That hurt. And here you were laughing at me. You were funny, Biff, Lee laughed. And that sting won't last long. Guess you're right. Hey, let's see if we can find out what our visitor was doing on board. The boys explored the deck of the boat. They opened the sail chest and inspected the sails. They hadn't been touched. They carefully examined the yawl's rigging. Both knew that an important rope could be cut just far enough through so that it would hold in a mild wind, then snap in a heavy one, just when it was most badly needed. No evidence of any tampering with the rigging. Let's go below. That's where the prowler was when we got here. He must have been doing his dirty work down there, Biff said. A careful search of the cabins, each with two berths, revealed nothing. Hey, look at this, Lee called. He was in the engine compartment, a small space between the forward cabin and the galley. Doesn't it look to you as if this has been moved recently? Lee pointed to the wooden cover which housed the engine. It was sitting slightly askew. We'll take a look underneath. Biff took one side of the housing, Lee the other. Careful now, heave gently. They removed the housing. Must be a flashlight round here somewhere. Have to have one if we're going to find anything. Lee found one in the tool chest. Biff took it and directed its beam of light on the top of the engine. Nice little engine, a four-cylinder Indian marine. Ought to shove us along around eight or ten knots. He placed the light's beam over the engine, inch by inch. Suddenly he brought the light's rays to a fixed spot. Biff bent low. Never saw anything like this on one of these engines. Take a look, Lee. Lee bent down beside Biff. The boys were looking at a crudely made object resembling a small tin can. It was roughly attached just below the engine's carburetor. Let's get out of here, Biff said, swallowing. His throat had become dry and tight. That thing's a bomb, a homemade bomb. Lee was already heading back to the cockpit. Hello there, ship ahoy, came a cry from the dock. Biff and Lee burst on deck just as his father and Mr. Mayonelli started to step on board. Stay back, Dad, stay back, there's a bomb on the boat, Biff yelled. Breathlessly, the boys told their fathers of spotting the prowler on board of the brief tussle and the results of their investigation. It's a good thing we came down, Tom Brewster said. You were late. We thought you might have run up against something. We sure did, Dad, Biff assured him. I'll have to investigate. Can you tell me exactly where this thing you think is a bomb is located? You're not going on board, are you, Dad? Biff asked, his voice filled with anxiety. I think it will be all right. I have an idea that bomb isn't intended to go off while the boat's still in harbour. But, Dad, it might, Biff protested. Biff, I've handled dynamite and other types of explosives in my work. I was also in the bomb demolition service in the army. I can handle it. You stay back, though, all of you, until I give you the all clear. 
Now just where is this thing you found? Directly under the carburetor, Biff replied. Here, you'll need this. He handed his father the flashlight. They watched Mr. Brewster's head disappear as he moved down the steps from the cockpit to the first cabin. I think we'd better follow your father's orders, boys, Hank Mahinelli said. We'll put a little distance between us and the boat, just in case. The three moved an anchor's rope's length from the stern of the boat. The minutes went by. The waiting became almost unbearable. Biff couldn't control the feeling of fear gnawing at the pit of his stomach. At any moment he expected to hear the dull thud of an explosion. He expected to see the boat burst open, sending wood and debris flying through the air. Minutes ticked on. Each one seemed an hour to Biff. At last he saw his father emerge from the cockpit. I've got it. It's all right. Biff ran to where his father stood. It may have been all right, but Biff could tell by the beads of perspiration standing out on his father's forehead and by his soaked shirt that it had been a ticklish job. It's a bomb, all right. Perez Soto is playing for keeps, Mr. Brewster said grimly. He wiped his forehead. It's a simple thing, really. Anyone with Perez Soto's experience, or mine, for that matter, could make it. But when was it set to go off? Biff asked. That would depend on when and how long we use the auxiliary engine. See this timer? The three leaned forward for a closer look, peering warily at the infernal machine Biff's father held in his hand. This timer, which is hooked up to the detonator, is fixed so it starts in motion when the engine is started. It cuts out when the engine is out. Very clever, actually, even though it is simple. When would the timer fire the charge? Biff asked. I judge after about an hour, perhaps two, no more, after the engine had been running. We'd be out in the middle of the ocean by then. Biff looked at Lee and Mr. Manelli. Both shook their heads. Worse than that, Biff, if I've got it figured right. How, Dad? Well, Perez Soto would know that we'd use the engine to get us out of the harbour. Maybe a twenty-minute run. Then we'd go to sail, and we'd use sail every minute we could. But then, this is the really devilish clever part of his plan, Mr. Brewster paused. He turned to Lee's father. Didn't you tell me that there are some dangerous reefs off Kaylay? You bet there are, Mr. Maynelli said, and the water's shark-infested too. Well, to search the coast along there for Huntington's sunken sloop, we'd have to use the engine. Couldn't take a chance with sail on those ragged coral reefs. I'm beginning to catch on, Dad, Biff said soberly. I expected you would. We'd have to use the engine, as you said, and right in the midst of those reefs and those sharks, bang, the boat would have blown up. And that would have been the end of us, Thomas Brewster said quietly. He tossed the deactivated bomb overboard. Rest in pieces, Biff said fervently. End of chapter 12